Really excited today. We have Chris Morvillo on the show. Uh, Chris is a partner at Clifford Chance, um, a former prosecutor in the Southern District of New York, which we will forgive him for, and uh, here to talk about an amazing uh, trial that just finished up. Um, welcome to the show, Chris. Oh, it's great to be here, David. Thank you so much for having me. What a thrill. So so let's get right into it. Um, you know, you represented client uh, who was referred to as Britain's Bill Gates. So so uh, that comes along with all kinds of of baggage. How'd you get involved in the case? Uh, it's, it's an interesting story. So uh, when when HP wrote down their investment in autonomy in November 2012, uh, that was big news, obviously. And uh, being at a global firm with big, big presence in the UK, I uh, sent a note to the head of our litigation group in, in England saying, just saw this. Is there anything that we can do to help on either side, really? Um, just just looking for an in. Um, and he wrote back about 15 minutes later and said, we've just been hired by the former CEO of Autonomy. When can you get here? Wow. Um, and that was literally the day before Thanksgiving um, in, in 2012. Um, so basically the day after the write down. Um, wow. And so you, you fly straight to, to London and, and meet with those folks? I, I, I left that Sunday after a couple of phone calls with Mike and others. Um, I left Sunday and what I thought was going to be a week, I came home right before Christmas um, and uh, then went right back after after the New Year holiday and uh, spent a significant portion of the rest of my life uh, bouncing back and forth between London and New York. Yeah, I mean, that starts in 2012. The trial was in 2024. Pretty, pretty wild. It was uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's 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 covered one third of my career. Um that makes me feel really old to say that because obviously that's more than 30 years, but at the same time, uh, it has been uh, a constant presence in my life uh, for the last 12 years. So Chris, Mike Lynch, I mean, it, there's other podcast connections. Um, we've interviewed, of course, your co-counsel, Brian Haberlig, before on a different case. Um, we just had Sean Hecker on the show who had a trial related to this case. Um, we've had your judge, Judge Breyer, on the show um, and so, so it's, it's cool to have this full circle to, to, to talk about this matter. I've listened to all those podcasts and they're great. Um, uh, all tough acts to follow. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but, but can you give us just a sort of brief summary of what the allegations are? And I know that's hard to do after a 10 week trial, but can you just summarize what Mike Lynch was charged with? Sure. So the, the, the basic allegation was that, uh, in the in the run up to the acquisition of autonomy by Hewlett Packard, um, aut autonomy had uh, engaged in a revenue recognition fraud that they had manipulated their earnings to make the company more attractive um, for an acquisition, uh, and that they had overstated their their revenue um, uh, in the two year period prior to the acquisition, and the allegations were. Uh, varied, um, some uh, allegations of backdating contracts to accelerate revenue, uh, some allegations of round trip transactions where they're purchasing and selling from the same uh, counterparty, uh, allegations that they uh, sold hardware at a loss, uh, undisclosed, um, but used that to pad revenue, um, uh, and a variety of other species along those lines. But essentially, it was a revenue recognition uh, uh, case. And so th there's a huge team, not just from your firm uh, representing Mike Lynch, but but there's also um, another huge law firm, uh, Steptoe and Johnson, obviously, with Brian. How do you all how does how does Brian get involved and how all do you work together with so, so many lawyers? So Steptoe came on around the same time that we did. Um, uh, the idea was to have a uh, global firm handling both sides of the Atlantic and, and also uh, uh, sizable presence, white collar presence in Washington, D.C., given the international nature of this, uh, close close relationships with the Justice Department. And so uh, Reed Weingarten and Brian uh, and Michelle Levin from Steptoe and I uh, from Clipper Chance uh, came on very early days. Um, uh, as I said, I was in within a day or so, uh, they were in within a week or so. Um, so it happened pretty quickly. And, and I read that, you know, when when Lynch gets brought over, 
bail is not just, you know, like a normal bail case in a white collar case where there's a signature bond and he's out. There were, you know, like armed guards uh, watching him 24 seven, which I found uh, odd. I, I've had that before with a foreign national um, as well, but it's it's really uh, expensive and difficult to deal with that. Well, um, it, it, it wasn't supposed to happen. Um, uh, we had negotiated an agreement with the Justice Department in advance of his extradition um, that was much less restrictive. Um, uh, in fact, uh, in connection with the extradition proceedings, the Justice Department went to Judge Breyer uh, to remove an issue from the extradition ab about the risk that Mike Lynch could be detained pre-trial, um, which uh, was an, a, an argument that resonated with U UK extradition courts uh, in terms of the fairness, um, and, and got an order from Judge Breyer that um, all things being equal and not changing, uh, bail would be uh, uh, approved in this case. Um, and the government had suggested to the UK court in the extradition uh, certain terms and conditions that they would find acceptable. When, when he was extradited, we basically negotiated those terms a little bit around the edges. Uh, Mike was uh, flown from, from England uh, in handcuffs the entire way, um, uh, uh, got to the courthouse at 5.30 on a Thursday um, after leaving 6 a.m. Uh, from his home in England, long day. Um, and Judge Breyer had other ideas um, and uh, basically imposed conditions that, that were beyond those that we had negotiated, including uh, armed guards, house arrest, um, uh, and a, a variety of other other conditions that uh, we had to meet before he could be released. Not a so, great way to start to start the case. You must have been thinking this is, you know, this is not going to go well with Judge Breyer. That, well, I mean, I had I had observed some of the the Hussein trial, which was the trial of the CFO that had occurred in in 2018, and I had a sense that Judge Breyer tried to be fair um, uh, and was fair uh, um, uh, as a as a, a judge to appear before. Um, but there's a long tail to this case, and uh, we were concerned that he had prejudged it uh, a little bit, and that the bail conditions that he imposed were. Um, a reaction to that. Uh, to um, uh, he, he concluded that 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 Mike was a severe flight risk in his view, despite the fact that Mike had been out on bail in England facing the extradition for several years and hadn't gone anywhere. Um, and so I think over the course of the ensuing months, <clears throat> as we started to get modifications of his of his conditions of release. Um, and started to litigate the case. Uh, the judge, the judge softened um, on that. And and so where does where does he live? Does he live in D.C., New York, uh, out in San Francisco? Obviously for the trial, San Francisco. But well, so one of the conditions that we had agreed with the government was that he could come back and forth from San Francisco to New York or Washington to prep for trial. But the judge uh, put the kibosh on that, and so he was required to remain under house arrest in San Francisco. That's that's um, wild. So you guys, you, you can only meet with him to, if you go out there. Trial prep by Zoom. Um, uh, you know, we had we had daily, very long sessions with Mike, and then of course, an enormous amount of time spent uh, in San Francisco. We were there uh, regularly, probably um, for you know two or three weeks uh, a month um, leading up to the trial. Incredible. Um, and so, in in getting ready for the trial. I mean, you know, we, we've talked a lot about this on the show in the past, which is, you know, trying to figure out what jury you want. Um, you're going to be out in San Francisco. You have a foreign national as a client. Um, do you do focus groups? Do you have a jury consultant? How, how does that work? Um, so we did have uh, jury consultants. Um, we did not do a focus group. Um uh, or a uh, you know a survey or anything like that, and a couple of reasons for that. First, um, uh, it was a pretty truncated uh, uh, pretrial period, and we were really um, busy preparing for uh, trial. You know, the government gave us an exhibit list with twelve thousand exhibits and eighty witnesses, and you know there were one hundred and twenty-five transactions that they were planning to prove, each of which could have been a case unto itself. Um, and so that was a, a, an impediment to doing a, a, taking the time to devote to a jury exercise. 
Uh, second, um, uh, the Hussein team had done the jury exercise um, and we had the tapes of that. Um, and so, although a very different client, an accounting fraud case against the accountant, you're testing certain issues. Uh, we had the CEO who's not an accountant, right? He's a, a visionary tech entrepreneur. Um, uh, so different issues. Um, but you could see some of the themes emerging from, from that, that we were able to educate ourselves on. Um, and third, I'm not a huge fan of focus groups. I think they're, they're, they're it's like it's like asking a movie critic to uh, do a review of a movie after watching the trailer. Um, uh, and so you, there's so much nuance, there's so much detail, it's really hard to unpack. And sometimes you get false um, positives uh, that that guide your strategy. And so uh, for those reasons, we didn't put a lot of of effort into doing that. And so, you know, you mentioned that there was this Hussein trial that occurred previously in front of Judge Breyer. Um, were you able to to glean a lot from that trial in preparation for yours? Was it helpful to see the government put on its case? I imagine it was very helpful. I mean, it was enormously helpful. I mean, obviously, we got the transcripts, but watching the witnesses testify live, uh, watching the judge, watching the way the prosecutors tried the case. Uh, those were all really important issues for us. At the time, uh, Mike hadn't been indicted, um, right? He, he, the, the, the Sushivan Hussein got indicted in, in, in November of 2016, uh, and they didn't indict Mike. Um, and so we thought that Mike might be a defense witness for Mr. Hussein uh, at that trial. And so I was largely there to not protect the flank necessarily, but more help prepare him for his testimony if that came to pass. Um, uh, but ultimately, watching that trial was invaluable in terms of what to expect when, when Mike faced trial. In addition, there was a, a civil trial that lasted for nine months in England in between the Hussein trial and uh, the Lynch criminal trial uh, where uh, that was brought by HP, where many of the same witnesses testified. And so uh, we had uh, a second uh, opportunity to view some of these witnesses. And uh, ultimately, we were able to stand on the shoulders of these you know, giants who came before us and, and uh, uh, learn a lot about uh, what would and what wouldn't work. I've always wanted to try a criminal case in England because, you know, you get to wear the wig and everything, but I don't think it's going to happen. They got a dispensation for that, uh, 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 given that uh, the trial was going to last too long through the summer. Um, uh, but they did they did wear wigs from time to time, which was quite, quite uh, entertaining. Now, now your case itself had a co-defendant involved. So, you know, your team is already pretty big and now you have to also coordinate with a co-defendant and his team. Um, how, how is that? Uh, going through the trial, working with a co-defendant and his lawyer. So Gary Linsenberg and his team from Bird Morella, fabulous lawyers, uh, wonderful experience, really seamless uh, to work with them. Uh, Gary's client, Steve Chamberlain, uh, was uh, uh, the VP of finance at Autonomy. Um, and so uh, you think you think about it in terms of a spectrum. Uh, you know, Hussein is in the middle. He's the CE, CFO. Lynch CEO um, and Chamberlain uh, sort of reporting into Hussein. And so the government was faced with the problem of trying basically two separate cases. Um, one really an accounting uh, nuanced detailed uh, uh, case about uh, whether the revenue should or shouldn't have been recognized. And the other was whether Lynch was aware of it and what statements was he making publicly that they might be able to use uh, a trial. So there were almost two different trials going on at the same time. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and we thought long and hard pre-trial about whether we wanted a severance. Right. Um, and of course, there was a long extradition uh, period between 2019, 2018, 2019, um, and the trial in 2024. Mr. Chamberlain waived extradition and could have gone to trial at any time uh, during that period, but he wanted a joint trial for a variety of reasons. Um, ultimately, I think it benefited us to have Gary and his team there. Uh, you know, two bites right? at each apple. Right, because it's hard when you have co-defendants um, at different levels in the business because there's a tendency, not not necessarily to finger point, which is always a disaster, but um, you know, if Chamberlain is saying, listen, this was all um, Mike Lynch doing this, it wasn't me, I wasn't in the inner circle, and I saw some of that um, in, in the portions of the trial I read, I mean, that's, how do you deal with that when, when the co-defendant's saying, listen, to, you know, ask Lynch about those things because I wasn't part of those decisions. 
so that was the tension, right? That that this Steve Chamberlain, although he was senior, um, was not in the inner circle. Uh, and the jury might say, all right, well, we'll let him go, but we'll convict Lynch. You'll have a right. compromise, split verdict. And uh, that's that was sort of motivating the, the idea behind a severance. Um, but um, the other side of that coin was the proof against Mr. Chamberlain and, and Mike was uh, un almost unrelated. Um, uh, and so there were really two trials going on separately, and that just made it to be a sort of a confusing um, gloop of, of, of evidence that came in, um, never really sure which defendant it was pointed at, um, uh, and gave us uh, innumerable opportunities to say to the witnesses and in front of the jury, this had nothing to do with Mike Lynch, right? You never met Mike Lynch. You never talked to Mike Lynch. Um, and in fact, the first seven witnesses, I think that the government called that lasted for three weeks, had never dealt with or spoken to Mike. And so they came out of the gate, um, guns blazing towards our co-defendant. Um, uh, but, you know, and, and he hadn't even met a lot of these people too. Uh, so it was, um, uh, it was a difficult um, uh, posture for the government to be in, I think, to try to do these, both of these cases simultaneously. You know, I always think about this, Chris, which is a, a lot of our work um, is in some ways random in terms of the results. Obviously, we 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 work so hard, and when we win, we think it's all us, and when we lose, we blame <clears throat> we blame others. But you know, Hussein gets convicted. Um, your two client, your client and Chamberlain get acquitted. I mean, it, it's odd, right? Like if Hussein was sitting next to you, maybe all three of you are acquitted. It, it, you almost feel so bad for him uh, having gone first and losing. Oh, it's uh, one of the great tragedies of this case. Sushivan Hussein is a wonderful person, and I think he should not have been prosecuted or convicted. He did serve time. Um, uh, this case, in my view, from the very outset, should have been a civil case. Um, uh, in fact, Reed, in his opening statement, um, uh, famously said, uh, this is why, why God made civil cases, um, <laughs> I love uh, it. Which, which got quite, quite a, a chuckle from everyone. But it's true. Um, and so, yes, look, Mr. Hussein was the CFO. Uh, there were is an accounting fraud case. There were some allegations of 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 backdating and conduct that that he had uh, that, that the government had evidence that he was involved with. Um, uh, and um, I think it, at times it felt like the government was just retrying that case again and trying to, you know, expand the circle to include Mike and Steve. So before we get into Reed Weingarten's opening, I want to talk to you about some of the things that I love about trial work that that don't get discussed a lot, which is when you try an out of town case, especially a long one like yours, yours was uh, almost three months. I mean, you're a New York guy, you move your life out to San Francisco. Um, where do you live? How do you do that? Uh, tell, tell us about that. Uh, that was a challenge. Um, we moved to San Francisco in full time in mid February. Trial started in mid March, um, and uh, uh, we had a big team. Uh, some people stayed in Airbnbs, some people stayed in hotels. I stayed in a hotel, um, and uh, I never came home, not once. Um, I was there for four months straight. Uh, it was brutal. Um, uh, in fact, you know, in January we did Rule 15 depositions in London, and so I was gone for most of January as well. And so I was used to being away from home quite a bit for, for in the run up to trial. Um, but that was really hard. Do you have kids, Chris? Uh, they, I do, but they're, they're 22 and 27. And so getting their attention is challenging sometimes. <laughs> okay. um, uh, and, uh, but I have a, a lovely wife and a dog uh, that, that, that missed me. Although I'm, I think my wife was, was, was happy that, that, uh, she had the dog to herself and, 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 <laughs> and, and, you know, didn't have to deal with, uh, uh, with with me every day and um, do, do you stay do you stay close to the courthouse i i always i'm a big believer in the closest hotel to the courthouse but people think i'm crazy for that so we we stayed um steptoe has an office in san francisco um and so we wanted to be in in shouting distance of the office because that's where we spent you know the the nights and the weekends um and so i was in between the courthouse and and steptoe's offices on market street um, it's pretty, pretty simple. It was a 15 minute walk to the office and a five minute Uber ride to the courthouse. Okay. And, and what about like exercise and taking care of yourself during trial and sleeping? Are, are you one of these guys who, who doesn't sleep and doesn't exercise during trial or how do you do it? 
uh, I exercised a lot in the run up to trial. Um, and then when we got into trial, uh, there was a lot of walking, um, a lot of walking, um, but not so much time in the gym. Um, I, I am somebody who needs uh, a good six hours of sleep at night. And so I would try to turn off most nights by 10, 30, 11 o'clock and get up a little bit early in the morning to, to continue the prep, depending on what was going on. Um, there was one day when, uh, for a variety of reasons, a witness uh, had to be taken out of order and was supposed to testify the next week. Um, and, uh, uh, it was my witness and, um, we weren't totally prepared to, to, to do that. And so we were up until three or four in the morning, Brutal. um, uh, for that one, just pulling that, that cross together. Um, although I have to say the lack of sleep made me a little bit more cranky and a little bit more effective, I think with this particular witness. Um, and so, uh, it was one of my favorite crosses isn't, of the trial. Isn't that um, funny? Um, you know, you, you, the, when the adrenaline's flowing like that and you get your no sleep and you just got to do it. And, and you know what you're doing, you got your themes, you're going to hit, you kind of get in a groove, you, you, you build a, a relationship with a witness, either positive or negative, but you got it and you kind of just go for it. Now, um, now I heard Chris that, um, judge Breyer did not have trial on Fridays, which during a long trial, sometimes people think that's good. Sometimes people think it's bad. What did you like that or no? Oh, we were crawling, crawling to Thursdays. And so Fridays were, were very welcome. Um, yeah. It, this was a hugely intensive document case. Uh, there were more than 2000 exhibits in evidence by the end. Um, and uh, each of the witnesses had testified multiple times. I mean, there was one witness that I crossed that had 1600 pages of 3500 material. Um, uh, I mean, you know, it's <laughs> war and peace times two, right? It's, it <laughs> was uh uh, and not exactly riveting stuff. Um, and so, so Unbelievable. Uh, having the time on Friday to regroup, um, you know, we weren't, we didn't know the government gave us a list of 70 witnesses that they might call. And, and, uh, before trial, they, they told us whether they were more or less likely to call a witness and, and what court tile they would appear in. But we didn't know until three days before a witness turned up who was coming. Um, and so while we had a lot of outlines, um, there were a lot of witnesses who we thought were testifying, never came, uh, and witnesses that we didn't think would come who turned up. Um, and so, you know, Friday was, was a big day to sort of regroup and figure out who was coming the next week. I also heard Chris, there were lots of, uh, superstitions with the group, like Thursday night dinners was at the same restaurant every Thursday night and that you were the wine guy. And uh, it was the same same wine every time, which was the Sea Smoke Pinot Noir. Now, see, I don't know Sea Smoke, but it sounds like, you know, a House of Dragons kind of wine. Uh, well, uh, it, 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 it was a wine that I had discovered just before trial and was thrilled to see it on the menu here. And in fact, chaos arose one, one Thursday night when we went and they didn't have any. Oh my goodness! What do we do? What this is the next week's going to be terrible. Um, but uh, it's a it's a great it's a great Pinot, uh, and, and there's lots of great Pinots in California. But superstitions prevailed, and 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 uh, uh, we, the, the 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 restaurant got to the point where they actually stocked it for us, so uh, they knew we would come in on a Thursday and get a couple of bottles. My next trial, I'm getting a bottle. Um, so so let's talk about the opening. Um, Reed, Reed Weingarten gives the opening. I, I love that he started with sort of like this subtle attack on the government. He says, you know, this was great advocacy, which I thought was, you know, a, a, a nice uh, jab at the government, which is, you know, they're just lawyers. This isn't really what the case is going to show. Um, but, th but the thing that jumped out at me, Chris, was the promise about the client testifying, which I've done a couple of times, but it's a huge risk, right? Oh, boy. Um, we went back and forth on that one uh extensively um in fact we were still debating it the weekend before the 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 kickoff um there was always a very 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 high likelihood that mike was going to testify for for two reasons one he's a very compelling person a very good communicator um and highly intelligent and it's just a great witness second and, and even more uh probably probative he had testified under cross-examination for 22 days in the UK civil case. And so the Justice Department had all of that. They were planning to admit uh, some of his testimony as admissions of a party opponent during uh, their case in chief. And so we knew that uh, Mike was going to have to get up and, and explain some of this stuff, contextualize it. Um, 
That being said, you know, as the trial progressed and, uh, you know, we're scoring points and co-opting government witnesses, um, we probably could have gotten away without putting him on the stand. I think his testimony was pivotal at the end of the day and probably is what um, uh, uh, won the day for us. Uh, but, you know, had we not done that, there would have been a very serious conversation to be had about um, calling him. Um, of course, the big downside, putting aside the fact that you can't not call him, um, is that the government knows he's coming. Right. And, right, and so in a 10 week, 12 week trial, uh, they're they're prepping. I mean, I think they always knew he was gonna testify. And so I, I don't think they just waited until trial started to start to prep, but um, that was that was the risk. But it, but it also, it's not just the prep for the cross, it's, it's tailoring some of the things that they're gonna do with their witnesses that they may not have to get out. They know they're gonna be able to do with your client. Um, so there is there is that those other risks associated with it. I, I will tell you one funny story. One time I did it, and I was it was a short trial, so I was nervous about them them getting ready. So I just said at the beginning, um, not only you know are we going to call them, but I challenged the government to call uh, the defendant as their first witness. We'll waive the Fifth Amendment, and they can call. Um, wow. And so it, it, interestingly, the prosecutors did not, call, it was a woman, did not call her as their first witness, but did call her uh, in their case in chief and did not know how to do it. So they were just asking her, you know, like what happened next? Uh, and she <laughs> she was just terrific uh, on their direct of her during their case in chief. Um, that's, that's, that's bold. Now telling the jury an opening is one thing, um, uh, asking them to call your client is a, is a completely separate issue. Yeah. Um, that, that was a fun one. Um, but, but there are so many risks. I, I just love, um, but taking those risks, I think you have to take risks to win a criminal trial. So I love that read open like that. And I think it was great. Well, I mean, think about this, right. You, you, you're in a long trial. Um, jurors are hearing the story come in piecemeal. Um, you don't want them to draw conclusions, right? There's going to be witnesses that that hurt. Uh, there's going to be witnesses that tell long stories. Um, and we wanted to plant the idea in their head from the very beginning, keep an open mind. You're going to hear from him. We promise you, you're going to hear from him. And so don't jump to any conclusions. Just just hold it in abeyance. Um, and that, that was really the, the main benefit, I think. You know, the other part I really liked about Reed's Reed Weingarten's opening is he says, you know, the government's opening was black and white. Uh, and you know what you're going to see in this trial? That's not the way the world works. The world works in gray. The world is complicated. I just love that. And I think that resonates. That's a message we should all be using in criminal cases with juries. That was a huge, huge theme for us, right? There, These guys are taking, and this is in all criminal cases, right? Government is telling a high level story. Uh, they're putting microscopes on, on, on certain conduct that's completely decontextualized. Um, and our job is to pull back the, the lens and show the conduct in the, in the environment in which it occurred. Um, and so uh, life is messy, life is nuanced, business is messy and nuanced, and, and those were important themes. And we hit them continually. In fact, uh, that was something that Mike testified about um, pretty much at the outset of his, of his own testimony. I saw that, you know, one of the main cooperating witnesses, this guy, Brent Hoganson, um, did not testify in the first trial, in the, in the Hussein trial, but did testify in your trial. And, and it looks like did not go well for, for the government. Why do you think they made the decision to change and, and call this guy at, at trial number two and not at trial number one when they had such success? Well, so I don't, I'm not sure they had a choice in trial number one. Mr. Hoganson lives in Panama oh, okay. um, and they did not have uh, the ability to, to, to get his testimony from what I understood. Um, uh, and I think, frankly, in the Hussein trial, the specter of Brent Hoganson um, was more effective than his actual presence at trial. Just to back up and put it into context, uh, uh, Brent was uh, the CFO of the Americas um, uh, for a, a, about a year um, and uh, uh, left um, uh, after, well, in his world, blowing the whistle on some conduct that he found to be uh, uh, questionable from an accounting perspective. In our world, he left because he had uh, engaged in some pretty serious misconduct and was trying to cover it up by being a whistleblower. Um, and, and that's where the, 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 the battle lines were drawn in his testimony. Um, uh, his direct was compelling. 
Um, he was a pretty good witness uh, for the government. He told a, co a cohesive story, um, but the government didn't didn't draw the sting um, on a lot of of uh, uh, his his own uh, misconduct. And Brian Haberlig really crushed him uh, in, in cross examination. And I think he left the courthouse. Uh, a very wounded witness along with the government's case at that point. Um, I think the jury was like, okay, this guy just can't be believed. But the government's thesis, right? They, they needed to tie Mike to the accounting allegations, um, but they couldn't because Mike's not an accountant. He's not in a, a, involved in it. He delegated that uh, responsibility to experts like Mr. Hussein and Mr. Chamberlain. Um, uh, and so what they wanted to show is that Mike was, was in control um, he was a he was a bully. He was a control freak. He uh, micromanaged um, and he quashed dissent. That was their thesis. Not true, not accurate, didn't play out that way. Um, but that's the theory that they went with. And so they needed the whistleblower type to come in who was then terminated um, uh, following his his uh, whistleblowing for misconduct. Um, uh, and they, they tried to turn that into this is Mike just quashing dissent. Um, and, and so, you know, obviously you guys go after him, you're successful in exposing him, but just a broader question in, in a long trial like this, Chris, are you guys getting along with the prosecutors? Is there, is it, is there just terrible tension throughout? I mean, how, how is that playing out? Um, it's a really great question, David. So, um, some of us got along really well with the prosecutors and some of us, not so much. Um, I, I tend to tended and typically tend to be the good cop. Um, and try to build bridges and um, uh, uh, keep a very positive relationship um, uh, to uh, get concessions, to get disclosure, you know, and it works from time to time, right? You get additional uh, uh, information from the repeated conversations you're having. You get, you know, advanced notice of which witnesses are coming as a courtesy, um, you know, when it's, when it's scorched earth, um, uh, those types of courtesies tend to disappear pretty quickly. Um, on the other side, there were um, some members of our team who didn't want to talk to the prosecutors, uh, were um, first, first of all, happy that I was, so they didn't need to. And it, it, it allowed us to sort of do this, you know, uh, good cop, bad cop uh, exercise with them and have credibility in front of the judge for, for doing that as well. Um, so. Um, Interesting. You know, it's, it's always such a hard thing. Um, you know, even because the client is there, obviously, and the client just despises the prosecution and the government. So even like simple things like shaking somebody's hand, the client uh, reacts to, and it's hard to sort of make sure the client understands that these are things sometimes you have to do. You know, the last trial I did, uh, was, which was up in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, um, uh, the, at the first appearance, I went over to shake the hands of the prosecutors and the client afterwards said, why did you shake their hand? What, what, why did you do that? Um, and I said, look, you know, you got to keep a good relationship. These guys are doing their job um, uh, and we will get benefits from having a good relationship with them at the end of the day. Um, but yes, instinctively, um, every defendant loathes the prosecution because they're the ones who, have, are, who are doing this. They're the face of the government. Um, and so it's it's a delicate balance to walk sometimes. So I see that the the government calls a summary witness, you know, one of these agents, and they put on their charts and their summaries. And then you guys do it um, and and you put on um, somebody to to summarize a bunch of things. And I've never seen anything like what happens after she testifies. Um, so, the government goes after your summary witness um, in a couple of ways. One is to attack the number of lawyers that she's working with and, and two, to sort of attack her qualifications and judge Breyer freaks uh, and does not like it. So it was um, a pivotal moment in the trial that nobody ever could have anticipated would have been a pivotal moment right? This is a summary witness. They're just putting some charts into evidence and testifying about simple math that they did or, you know, where the, the, the charts, how the charts were compiled. Um, and this witness, uh, Harriet Slack, and a senior associate in our, our UK office who had worked on the case with us for probably a decade, 
um, wonderful, smart, kind uh, woman um, and was a great, great witness. Um, uh, and, you know, we had some hesitation about putting a lawyer on the stand as a summary witness, but we wanted to inject a little bit of the uh, fact that this is a UK citizen, a UK case. A lot of the conduct occurred in England. Um, and, and again, Harriet being so uh, appealing was, was a great choice for it. Um, uh, but the prosecution started their cross um, by uh, uh, asking her about how much money she gets paid, uh, her bonuses, who approves her bonuses, um, the uh, uh, length of time she's worked on the case. They went through her bio, uh, which included, you know, fraud litigation and m &A litigation and extraditions. Of course, if Lynch had been extradited, that fact wasn't in front of the jury. And so they, they paused on extradition and asked the uh, 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 Harriet to explain what an extradition was. Um, uh, then they went through uh, all the lawyers who had filed a notice of appearance uh, and asked who they were and whether they had helped prep her for her testimony. I think knowing full well uh, that they none of them had because they knew who did. Um, and they didn't ask about those two lawyers. Um, and so, uh, and of course, we're sitting there thinking, this is highly objectionable. We should, we should, we, you know, but you have to be careful that you're hiding something. And right. so we kind of, we kind of let it go. Um, uh, and then um, it, it really blew up after, after she uh, left the witness stand. Um, uh, there were motions for mistrial. Um, there was some litigation briefing overnight. Um, and the next day uh, the judge came in after having reviewed the filings and the, uh, uh, the transcript again, uh, and really laid into the government. Um, uh, sorry. It, 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 it's incredible. And you guys must have been sitting there while she's testifying, just seething. Uh, I can I can almost picture the smoke coming out of your ears. So so picture this scene. Harriet's up on the witness stand. Um, we're at counsel table, sort of in her peripheral vision. And post-it notes are there's like a, a rainstorm <laughs> of post-it notes uh, going back and forth. Um, and she's up there thinking, "Oh no, I've really stepped in it. I've said something I shouldn't have said." Um, uh, and so yeah, it, it was it was it was way over the line. And it was it was the witness before Mike Lynch was going to take the stand. So we are literally at the end of the trial now. Um, and, and so there was an argument that they were trying to goad us into seeking a mistrial by engaging in this, um, that, that Breyer rejected, although he said he would have to have a hearing if necessary to determine that. Um, but the instruction that he gave to the jury, um, when he struck the entire cross-examination, uh, the impeachment piece of the cross-examination leading up to testimony about the, the charts that she put in, um, uh, to the jury went on for about five minutes um, uh, and went through each of the issues and topics um, and, and told the jury that what the government had done was entirely improper. So I've never seen an instruction like this. I, I, I printed out it's five pages. So it goes on for about five minutes. I, I have to read some of it because you, you, you would not, like you say, never think a summary witness is going to be a pivotal moment. But when a jury hears an instruction like this, to me, this is this is a lightning bolt uh, in the trial. So, so I'll just read a couple portions of it. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's just so incredible. He says, number one, a defendant who has resources is able and in fact probably should employ the number of counsel that they feel appropriate to give a legitimate defense. Number two, in terms of documents, there are at least 15 or 16 million documents of which you have perhaps seen a thousand during this case. There's no way a person can actually defend himself against charges emanating from 13 years ago, 14 years ago, literally millions of documents without employing an adequate number of investigators and lawyers to review the documentation to advise the parties. Number three, the fact that somebody has the resources to do it is not evidence of any kind that you can consider. Next, if you think that Dr. Lynch has considerable resources, you ought to think about what the United States government has. They're not out-resourcing the government of the United States, and you should take no inference whatsoever that Dr. Lynch has utilized these resources. And I'm instructing you to disregard all of those questions. It goes on for pages. He says, and I will tell you, I observed her testimony. There is absolutely nothing that I saw in her testimony that suggests that somehow she didn't exercise her duties professionally and within the code of conduct. Now, why have I gone out about this? Breyer says, I'll tell you why. 
It's one thing for a judge to say to a jury, you know what? I strike this testimony. Don't think about it. Don't consider it. But you and I all know that once you hear something, it's very hard to take it out of your mind. And what I'm really concerned about here is what I call unconscious bias or unconscious utilization of information that somehow it's going to affect your judgment. And I don't want it to affect your judgment. I mean, Chris, I've never heard anything like this. And I just pulled out a couple portions of it. Well, so we we were sitting there before he did that. He he went on for an equal amount of time outside the presence of the jury, explaining his thinking and why he was going to do it, and that was even harsher. Um, and so you know you could you could sort of see the government shrinking away as this instructions being read to the jury. Um, but I think what he did he did it for two reasons. One, it was totally inappropriate what what happened for a summary witness. For any other kind of witness, fair game. Go through their bio, go through their background, uh, try to impair their credibility. But for summary witness, it really is is something that uh, uh, was was just a bridge too far. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I think he was also concerned about the mistrial motion, um, and so his instruction was really to say, "I cured it, right. I, I fixed it. You guys are not suffering any prejudice here," um, and uh, so. I'm not saying it, he was manipulative in any way. He meant it and felt it, and he was leaning into the microphone as he spoke. Um, but that that certainly had to be part of his thinking. That this is better than any mistrial you could have gotten, of course. And, and then and, and then he says, "Call your next witness." Okay, we call Mike Lynch to the stand. I mean, literally, Mike floated to the witness stand on the back of that instruction to the jury, um, uh, and so it, it could not have been better time from from our perspective. Un unbelievable, and you know, a lot. This is why trials are so great, right? Like you work so hard and for so long in these trials, and then, like, this is manna from heaven during a summary witness that nobody could have ever predicted in a million years. That, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, <laughs> poor Harriet, uh, 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 you know, literally had a flight home that night. Um, and so left thinking that she had, you know, created a controversy in the courtroom. Um, and it turned out that it was, you know, a pivotal moment in the trial that frankly, uh, uh, you know, I, I think had a much, much bigger effect than even her testimony. Um, <laughs> right. On the summary witness, the summary charts. And then, of course, now you, you've, of course, promised your client to testify. You're putting him on. I mean, after that instruction, uh, who knows, maybe you wouldn't have done it. But at this point, you're, it's all in. You're, you're, you're calling him to the stand. And he's on the stand for what? Almost a week, Chris. Yeah. So we had uh, it, it was there was a lot of strategic thinking going into when he was going to hit the stand. We had, um, you know, you, as you can probably uh, imagine, David, um, we didn't want to just put Mike on the stand, right? We wanted to surround him with other witnesses. We didn't want to make the defense case just Mike's testimony. Um, and so we had a bunch of witnesses. We wanted Mike to be last, um, but we were also coming up against the Memorial Day weekend. Um, and we didn't want Mike to be dangling on, on right. his direct testimony, giving the government four long days to uh, hone their, their, their swords to take him down. And so... Uh, it worked out perfectly for us, frankly. He started testifying on Thursday uh, before the, the long holiday weekend, and we got through the overview of the case, the background, his personal background, the background of, of autonomy, um, and a couple of the uh, bigger allegations, um, and saved a lot of the, the, the more nuanced stuff for, for Tuesday, uh, the stuff that we knew the government was going to go after. So we didn't give them uh, uh, a preview uh, until until they you know they had to get up and cross them on Tuesday afternoon or no really. that's perfect you leave the jury with the long weekend with sort of the good background stuff and then exactly and then dive into it the following week I, I will say Mike gave a quote your client gave a quote that I will use I think in every future criminal case that I have um, which is um. And I think this is a direct quote. There are people that cut corners that shouldn't have. There are a thousand little realities. A lot of what we've been looking at is like peering through the door of a kitchen and seeing the sausage making machine. And that's how it really works. If you take the microscope, even into the most spotless kitchen, you'd find bacteria. If it wasn't there, that'd be something very abnormal. I don't think autonomy was any different. I love that. I mean, to yeah. me, that is awesome. We, 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 you know, we talked about that, finding the right analogy a lot 
uh, in the run up to his testimony. Um, and that one really stuck with us as the right way to encapsulate the nuance and the subtlety of running a multinational company or frankly life as we talked about earlier right it's just it's again the government puts this spotlight on conduct um and you need to 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 broaden the horizons and yeah of course uh not nothing's perfect uh in life and and with a multinational company with 2000 employees and and 2 billion dollars in in revenue over the relevant time period of course someone's going to do something that uh, uh it could, could could look look like a problem until you put it into context. Right. And I think it's true, whether it's 2000 employees or two employees at a mom yep. and pop shop. I mean, the, the the truth is when the government shines a light on you, they're going to find some some stuff that doesn't look right. And um, that doesn't mean you're a criminal. I, I just love it. Thank you. Yeah, no, that was that was that was a uh, we, we landed on that. Um, and it really just encapsulate the encapsulated the theme of of, of the, the defense or one of them. Um. So he testifies, he does a great job, but then your co-defendant does not testify. And again, this to me is another tension with being, with sitting at the table with another defendant. Um, there had to have been extraordinary amount of pressure on Chamberlain to testify after your guy does. So, you know, Mike was such a compelling witness and carried so much water um, that I think when Gary uh, considered whether to put Steve on. And, and that was also a game time decision as, as it is so often. Um, he looked at where we were. He looked at how Mike had done um, and felt that Mike had, had conducted a, a, a broad defense of the conduct and responded to all the allegations sufficiently uh, that in tandem with some of the other witnesses that we called, it just wasn't necessary. Um, and, uh, and Steve is a finance. He's a uh, guy, he's an accountant. Uh, Mike is, is is the CEO? He's the the right. spokesperson for the company, right? He's very comfortable with a microphone, um, and uh, just very different setting. And so, um, I think I think Gary made the right decision there. I think Steve's a wonderful person. He would have been a good witness, um, but I didn't think it was necessary after Mike's testimony, particularly given the fact that that hit Mike's cross didn't really uh, land a lot of blows. Um, and so we came out of Mike's testimony you know, armed with gems for, for, for closing. Um, and so uh, I think Gary just looked at that and said, I'm going to stand pat. Now, I, I got to ask you, so, you know, you obviously put the client on, um, Reed opens, Brian closes. So, you know, there's a split of, of the major parts of the trial, but any trial lawyer is going to want to close and you would just put the client on. It did great. He did great. Like, aren't you dying to get up there and close? Yes. No, <laughs> without a question. Um, yeah. So, so, when, when Brian and I talked about closing in Mike's testimony, um, uh, we agreed that we should split the closing um, and that uh, I would do the first hour and he'd take the next hour and a half. Um, and I like that idea a little bit, um, uh, but I also really thought that given the scope of this case, having one person just get up there and kind of walk through it chronologically made more sense. Hard to pick your spots uh, as to how to divide it up. Um, and I, I also felt like, Hey, I'd known Mike for 12 years. I could, uh, our, the testimony, uh, his direct testimony was a conversation. It was like sitting in a, a, a mostly spotless kitchen um, uh, and, and having a chat about the, the, the arc of this case. Um, and I viewed it as a summation. Um, I viewed it as an opportunity to really tell the story over 10 hours, which is how long it lasted. Um, and so as we got closer to, to decision time, I said to Brian, look, I've got way too much work to do uh, with Mike prepping him for his testimony. Uh, I think it makes more sense for you to take this. And he was all too happy to do that, of course. Um, it's so it's so nice to hear, you know, that all these different parts could work together so seamlessly, because a lot of times, I mean, it does not work like that. And you're just halfway through the trial saying, you know, hey, buddy, uh, you're not going to do anything else. And it's it's a very difficult dynamic when you're trying cases with with other folks. So to have trial partners that you can trust, I mean, and that's the big thing, right? To be able to trust and say, you do the closing because I'm going to do the the direct of the client and put the client on. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It was great. I mean, look, trying a case with two firms, 
was a wonderful experience, but there's, there's inherent tensions in there, right? right? You know, you don't really control the associates of the other firm and can't really uh, tell them what to do. Um, and you also don't want to tread on somebody, uh, somebody's toes. Um, uh, so we, we, and we were, we were working out of their offices in San Francisco, but Brian is a massively close friend. We were in the trenches together for the, on this for a long time. Um, and he, he totally deserved to do the closing. He did a fabulous job, uh, and 42 witnesses testified during the course of the trial, right? There was plenty of interesting right. work to do. Great arguments. Great. Uh, we, we want a rule 16 motion. Uh, that was argued by my, my, my partner, Celeste Kuhleveld. Um, uh, my partner, Dan Silver put on a great defense witness and handled a couple of really tricky crosses. Uh, there were two step toe partners, Michelle Levin and, and Jonathan Baum in addition to Reed and Brian, who handled important witnesses. And so we acted as one large team. And we had a number of, of, of associates uh, for both sides uh, who all got along really well. I mean, people were sitting on floors in the, in the, in the office, three people in, in one small little office with, with monitors. Uh, so it was, it was chaotic. Surprised there wasn't some sort of outbreak of some new disease as a result of the first <laughs> quarter, but uh, it was remarkable. So, so the jury goes out after Brian closes. How long is the jury out for? Um, almost two days, a little bit less. Um, they go out at two o'clock on uh, Tuesday, um, and uh, we get a quick note from them asking for the documents that corresponded to the wire fraud counts. And so what was the email that's the subject of count two, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that was low hanging fruit. We got that to them pretty quickly on Wednesday morning. And then Wednesday we heard nothing, not a peep. Um, at the end of the day, uh, uh, I went down to the courtroom and, and uh, the courtroom deputy said that they've been quiet all day, but they're leaving at four. Um, you guys can go then. So I went back upstairs, reported, uh, we're in the attorney lounge on the the 18th floor of the courthouse in San Francisco. Um, and there's 20 of us in there, the clients, family, lawyers, playing cards, listening to music, reading, stressing, pacing, <laughs> you know, the, the, you, you know, the feeling. Um, the worst. Uh, and we, we leave at four. As we're in the elevator going down, we get an email from the deputy saying that there are two notes um, and we open them up and they are like grand jury subpoenas. They are seeking <laughs> details, read back, um, uh, documents. Like it was, it was, we're looking at this and, and saying, Oh my God, first of all, they're in the belly of the case in, in the, in one of the core allegations. Uh, and second, it's going to take us many hours to pull this all together. You must have um, been dying. I, I, well, you know, of course you look at a, at a note, you don't know who, 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 what they're looking for. Is it one person who's interested in this? Is it everybody? It wasn't signed by the four person. Um, and so that was a small clue that maybe it was just, you know, someone who was like, well, it'd be nice to see what this stuff says. Um, we had a dinner plan that night. We canceled the dinner. Um, we all went back to the office. We worked until midnight trying to pull the stuff together back in court the next morning at eight 30. Um, and the judge says to the government, look, um, you've got the burden of proof. You figure out what you think is responsive. Tell the defense. If they agree, great. If they don't, um, work it out. If you can't work it out, come back and see me. But let's get the stuff to the jury. So we retreat to our corners. We're emailing back and forth. We're just, you know, negotiating uh, designations. Um, and it's about 1145. And I'm sitting in a conference room just finishing up the designations for Lynch's testimony read back. Um, and we get a note saying there's a verdict. Wow. Um, and it was sort of one of those moments where you're like, wait, this, I'm, this can't be right. We haven't right. responded to the note. Right. And we've been working for the last 12 hours to, to respond to it. Um, so uh, uh, I go out into the main room uh, and no one else has seen the email yet. And so I kind of announced that there's a verdict and people look at me like, you know, that's not funny. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> where, where I'm like, really, seriously, look at your emails. And then it just went silent. It was like, oh shit, right? Here we are, um, they've made a decision. Um, and we had some some theories that it might've been, we were might be heading towards a hung jury, right? Just body language of jurors and whatnot. So um, uh, we trundled down to the courtroom and uh, Breyer's already sitting on the bench. Um, prosecution's there, word is spread in the US attorney's office. There's you know, half of the courtrooms filled with prosecutors. 
um, uh, 15 to 20 reporters. We've got our whole team. So there was, it was a packed, packed courtroom. Um, and Mike comes in with his lovely wife, Angela, um, uh, puts her in the front row, kisses her on the forehead and walks into the well of the courtroom. And, you know, we didn't know if Breyer was going to remand him if he got convicted. We didn't know whether he was ever going to walk out of the courtroom with his wife. And so I realize I can't swallow. I'm parched, like literally right. like, like a desert in my throat. So I, I go to get a cup of water at the water cooler and my hands are shaking so much that the water is flopping out of the top of the, of the cup. Um, uh, I sit down next to Mike. I give him some words of comfort and tell him, you know, they're going to take this one day at a time. And we hear the jury outside uh, of the, the door to the courtroom. And it sounds like they're laughing. Oh, wow. That's um, a good sign. It's a good sign. It's a good sign. Although I, I will say I told the story to someone the day after and he said, yeah, my last trial, the jury laughed and came in and convicted. So oh. uh, <laughs> you, can't, you can't bank on it. Um, uh, uh, and I leaned over to Brian and I said, they're laughing, right? A good sign, right? And he's like, I think so. They come in stone-faced. Um, uh, one juror who we really liked looked over at us um, and gave us this sort of weak Mona Lisa type smile. At least it seemed like a smile. Um, uh, uh, and then the four person handed up the verdict form, six pages. Breyer flipped through it, didn't make any uh, reaction, handed it to his deputy who got up and read the not guilty verdict for count one, right? There's 15 counts. Um, count one being the wire fraud conspiracy. Um, and Mike's wife leaps up um, and, you know, screams and, 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 and runs into the well of the courtroom oh. to throw her arms around her, her husband. Um, but we still have 14 counts oh. to go. Oh my God. Um, uh, and now, of course, we're all starting to well up with emotion. And Judge Breyer, to his credit, sees this and says, and with respect to counts two through 15, also not guilty. <laughs> Um, oh, wow. uh, and then the whole, at least our side of the courtroom erupted and it was this electric moment. Um, I've never seen anything like it in a courtroom before grown people sobbing, um, hugging, um, uh, audibly, uh, people clapping. It was, it was remarkable. No better um, moment. It, it, really there's the, those who have not practiced criminal law do not understand what a not guilty verdict is, especially in a case like this. It's just, it's, there's nothing like it in the world. I mean, this has been a 12 year saga for Mike, right? right? Um, and, and having watched his good friend, Sue Siobhan convicted, having uh, lost the civil case in England, having lost, fought and lost extradition um, to have this vindication Amazing. Um, after all these years was incredible. So do you uh, go, do you go to the same restaurant and ha drink the same wine that night, or where's the celebration? <laughs> so uh, we didn't. Once the trial was over, the the the, the good the good vibes worked, um, and we went to a place that could accommodate much more of us, uh, and we had a a very very large. Uh, celebration that lasted into the wee small hours of the morning. Um, awesome. So uh, great, Chris. It's it's really incredible. And and I heard, by the way, that you get to speak to the jury afterwards. Amazing. It was an amazing um, opportunity. You know, I've spoken to a couple of juries, typically, uh, particularly when I was a prosecutor and there had been a, a hung jury, um, right? But this was um, stunning. The judge says, I'm going to go talk to them um, uh, and thank them. And then I'm going to ask if they want to come into the courtroom, they can come in and, 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 and meet with you, but I'm not going to force anybody to do it. Um, but stick around. Your client shouldn't be here because that might chill the conversation, um, but stick around. So 10 minutes later, all 12 of the jurors walk back into the courtroom um, and uh, Brian and I and Gary get up and each thank them uh, for their service. And they were an incredible jury. And the prosecutors really... are there too, or they leave? Or they so leave? the two lead prosecutors left. Um, but the two junior prosecutors and the FBI agent and their paralegal stayed. Um, uh, and uh, we say to them, look, we've got a lot of questions for you. We're sure you have a lot of questions for us, but why don't you guys go first? And so um, uh, this one juror raises his hand. He's 27 years old. He's about to be a law student. At, 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 um, and so he was, he was somebody we were a little concerned about given his interest in the law. Um, and he looks at me, he says, this one's for you, Mr. Morvillo how many pairs of reading glasses do you have? Ah. Um, and I mean, all of us started laughing because it had kind of been this issue with trial. 
Um, I, I have these cheap reading glasses, but they come in many colors. Um, and I break them, lose them, drop them, scratch them. Um, and I just, you know, grab whatever pair I have that I need that day. And so I had seven or eight with me out there. Um, and, and, uh, that was one of the things of course that they can't talk about the case. And so they're like, well, ties, socks, glasses, um, hysterical. I love it. I love um, it. Um, but, then, but then they started asking these great questions. Um, you know, one of the things that they, that we did in, in closing that Brian did so well was put up a slide that showed the top 20 topics that the government had focused their case in chief on that they didn't ask Mike Lynch one question about when he Oh, I love it. It's great. Um, and we said, those points are con conceded. Um, and so the jury then says, what was your strategic thinking there? Why didn't you cross them? You had them right there. You should have, you, why, why didn't you ask them those questions? And of course the reaction was, well, that's just one of those questions that we're not going to be able to answer. Uh, and, uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> and I think that was a reaction the jury had. Um, uh, but you know, it's just so interesting. Uh, we had a really smart jury. We had an oncologist, we had three or four software engineers. Most people had college degrees, some graduate degrees. Um, and you know, as we were thanking them, one of the jurors who was an oncologist, uh, says, you know, the people you really should be thanking are, are our employers who, who, who pay us, uh, to, to serve on a jury Great point. Um, and for, for a three month trial. If, if we didn't have employers who supported this, you would have had a very different jury. And, and the answer is absolutely um, uh, amazing. Fundamental. amazing. And, and a great point and one that we don't often think about. I, I also heard <clears throat> that there were a couple of counts severed before the trial. Sir, where, where are those guys? Is the government going to keep pursuing those or where are those? No, counts? they've actually now dismissed um, the Terrific. one. So, so there was one count. It was actually a really pivotal count. Um, Count, we call it count 17, uh, uh, which was an obstruction count that was not at issue in the Hussein trial. They, they added it just with respect to Lynch. Uh, and it really charged this sort of overarching, broad-based, amorphous obstruction campaign that, that, that related to um, uh, Mike's, port, uh, Mike's companies. He, he's a, in private equity now and, and has a couple of portfolio companies hiring former autonomy people to come work there um, uh, you know, uh, not turning over documents, you know, stuff that was easily defend defensible. Um, but of course, you know, if you stitch it all together, uh, with, as a prosecutor, you can make it seem nefarious. And so we kind of liked the charge, um, partially because it, it opened the door in our view to bring in a lot of evidence that occurred after the autonomy acquisition, uh, by HP that we think, made it clear that the reason for the write down was because of HP's mismanagement, not because of any historical accounting fraud, but Breyer had kept it out, all the post act stuff, kept it out in the civil, in the, in the Hussein trial, uh, and kept it out in this trial as well. And when we teed it up for him and said, this is what count 17 does, we need to be able to bring all this in and we need some, some subpoenas, uh, uh, to HP to be able to effectuate it. Um, he said, I have a better idea. We're going to sever it. Um, none of that stuff's coming in. Wow. Not relevant. I don't want it to, I don't want to have a trial within a trial. We'll be here for, for a year, um, which was bad for us because we really liked the, the evidence that was, was post act, but it was, it was even worse as it turns out for the government because they wanted to try this case with a, the patina of consciousness of guilt, right? The, uh, the old obstruction being worse than the, the cover up being worse than the crime. Um, and they lost that. Um, and so as a result, um, shortly after that, they added witnesses to their witness list. They gave us a, an exhibit list with 12,000 exhibits on it. They added another hundred transactions that they intended to prove at trial. And so they just, I think, calculated, we need to double down on, on this and throw everything we've got at it. And ultimately that caused, I think, problems for them because it was just too unwieldy a trial. But um, after the verdict was read, um, and we're all sort of still sobbing in the courtroom. Um, Breyer says, now we still have to deal with count 17. Oh, and it was just God. sort of like right. deflating, right? Like, oh, uh. that, um, uh, and he says, we'll come back at three o'clock today and deal with that. And, and, and strongly indicated that, you know, if you can't prove liability on the underlying conduct, right. the, the obstruction is not going to be very powerful. And so the government did the right thing a few weeks later and, and, uh, dismissed it.
Terrific, Chris. What an inspirational story, a unbelievable saga that you that you were victorious in. And, and just uh, congratulations. Thank you for doing the show and, and telling everybody about it. It was really incredible. No, I mean, gosh, we could we could probably do a whole season on this show. Um, uh, it's uh, it's a, it's just a saga. Um, so many, so many things we haven't even talked about, uh, David, but I am just delighted to have been able to spend a little time with you today.